Hello everyone, my name is Scooby Leposki. I'm the great nephew of Ben F. Leposki, widely considered to be one of the first electronic artists to use oscilloscopes. For the past five years, I've been going through Ben's archive and written correspondence for my forthcoming book on his life and work. For me personally, it's been a fascinating experience to learn family history as it parallels the history of electronic art. I'm excited to share with you all for Vector Hack 2020 some of my findings and insights into Ben's work. Thanks for checking out my lecture. I'd like to start with this map of the United States and the pin drop of Cherokee, Iowa. Cherokee is my hometown as well as Ben's hometown where he spent his entire career as an electronic abstractionist and commercial artist. Ben's location in the rural Midwest made written correspondence imperative to furthering his ideas and opportunities. This prolific level of written correspondence coupled with Ben's own archival aptitude has provided me with a wealth of insight into his artistic process. Although in relative cultural isolation, Ben remained in regular rapport with some of the leading minds of his time. Ben lived in the same apartment almost all of his adult life, pictured as the apartment building where all of his major discoveries occurred. An entirely self-taught mathematician, draftsman, and commercial artist, Ben's interest in higher education was thwarted by the Great Depression in the 1930s. However, his erudition had already started modulating the paths of interest in math, art, and nature. An idea that Ben's colleague from MIT, Yorgi Keeps, would later call interthinking and interseeing. This slide is from an essay that was written for the Leonardo Journal in 1978 titled Magic Squares, a Design Source. Ben addressed the origin story of his electronic abstractions by detailing his analysis of magic square constant summation line tracings. Magic squares have appeared throughout civilization for thousands of years and line tracings were often done for occult purposes, such as the creation of sigils. One of the most famous magic squares appears in Albert Durer's engraving, Melancholia I. Its numerous summation patterns of 34 have been documented extensively. Ben created hundreds of his own magic squares in mathematical puzzles throughout the 1930s and 40s. Many were published for the popular syndicated Ripley Believe It or Not newspaper panel over a period of 25 years. This is an example of a mathematical puzzle of Ben's that was published for Ripley. Ben fully explored magic squares often using different shapes and even venturing into the third and fourth dimensions. The following pages are notes of his analysis of magic square line tracings, which he began in the early 1930s. One can see Ben exhausting all of the possible geometric patterns from a fifth order magic square utilizing various groups beyond just constant summation. This image is from the same Leonardo essay illustrating the kinds of patterns that could be created from taking the line tracings a step further into the design realm. Ben was also an avid microscopist, 
learning the snowflake capturing technique from correspondence with famed weather scientist Dr. Vincent Schaefer. Ben contributed an article to the Micronotes Journal detailing this process and highlighted a few tricks he had devised himself for successful capture and preservation. One can see the symmetry and natural beauty of these frozen microscopic patterns. In the 1940s, Ben began exploring the use of pendulum tracing machines and harmonographs to actualize his idea of the triangle of form. A letter to the Micronotes editor in 1949 discusses this relationship. Ben states, There is a triangular relationship which exists between mathematics, art forms, especially in design, and natural forms. Mathematics furnishes geometric figures, polyhedra, curves of all types, serial rhythms, and other ideas. In nature, we have, of course, crystals, flowers, plants, and microscopical objects, such as diatoms, radiolaria, foraminifera, as well as other forms. From both of these apices, we can draw to derive inspiration for design and art. It is this triangle of form which is my object of study and research. In 1947, Ben encountered an article in Popular Science magazine that proposed the use of TV testing equipment, such as oscilloscopes, to generate simple decorative patterns based on similar math that governs pendulum curves. The kinetic mechanical possibilities of his harmonographic and pendulum experimentation did not reveal new aesthetic forms for him, so Ben knew entering into this new paradigm of the analog electronic would allow for a new visual language to unfold. He became his own engineer, learning how to build the necessary equipment by reading the trade magazines, radio and television news, and radio electronics. Early radios and televisions used components that required servicing on an annual basis, so these types of publications were prominent and popular. A significant portion of these publications addressed the service industry, providing schematics and parts suppliers. This is an early press shot of Ben demonstrating a simple abstract form on one of his oscilloscopes. Ben's equipment began with devices utilizing standard schematics, but progressed into custom circuits as his knowledge of how to conduct the cathode ray tube's electron beam expanded. My grandfather, Ray, worked closely with Ben to construct camera mounting systems that would allow for the best capture of the oscilloscope screen. Ben was already an avid photographer prior to his oscillonic work, so developing and printing the oscillons was a fluid part of his workflow. The next series of slides document some of Ben's equipment in their current condition. This is a modified oscilloscope, one of the six that Ben used. This is a custom magnetic deflection control panel. I know this particular device had numerous versions throughout Ben's output. and uh, a smaller magnetic deflection control panel. A sine wave oscillator, very basic but very essential. And another oscillator, this one by Heathkit. The next two slides are pages from Ben's technical notebook detailing the circuit record or signal path for oscillons that had aesthetic value. Ben noted the device settings as well, 
But the finicky and unpredictable behavior of analog circuits did not really allow for an image to ever be repeated in its exact form. Ben began this oscillonic work in 1950. Two years later, he had photographed thousands of non-objective abstract forms. From over 6,000 of these oscillons, a collection of 50 black and white images were exhibited. The Stanford Museum in Cherokee held the debut exhibition in 1953. Electronic abstractions, a new approach to design, garnered local acclaim and interest and soon traveled out of the Midwest to the larger cultural centers, both domestically and internationally. This next group of slides is documentation of the debut exhibition at the Sanford Museum. This is a small selection of the original black and white oscillons that were exhibited. After a few years of the Ceylons being exhibited extensively, Ben was asked to share some of the schematics for his devices in the 1955 April issue of Radio Electronics. Ben was contemplating patenting some of the custom circuits for a boutique device that could be purchased to achieve similar results as his. He instead wrote an article on the aesthetic possibilities of the oscilloscope and explained some of the modulations that were used to create specific oscillons. His extensive DIY approach to circuitry led him full circle to the publication he had begun learning from. Much of the correspondence, such as the request from Radio Electronics Magazine, came from Ben's own initiative to get his work recognized. All the pamphlets and brochures explaining the process and showcasing the oscillons were solely endeavors of his. The Sanford Museum circulated a complete set of oscillons for exhibiting, but many of the oscillon shows were coordinated directly by Ben. A small collection of matted oscillons traveled in these hard cases with explicit instructions on how to install them. Ben also kept detailed maps of the places where his work had been exhibited. Throughout the creation and exhibition of the Ceylons, Ben continued to work as a commercial artist. His focus for the Ceylons was not limited to their appearance in cultural and scientific institutions but also as new forms to be used in the applied arts. The largest exposure for the Ceylons came from a feature in Fortune magazine in 1956 called Electronic Gaiety. This editorial would go on to win a New York art director's gold medal. From this award, numerous advertising agencies and companies with in-house art departments reached out to Ben. One particular opportunity arose from a company expanding into petrochemicals called Monsanto. Monsanto was working closely with MIT architects to create a home of the future for an upcoming Disneyland attraction. 
An executive from Monsanto had seen the Asilons in Fortune and inquired about using frame ones to help create a futuristic sense for this new type of domestic setting. I've not been able to find any further info on whether or not this happened, but judging by other correspondence with Ben, Monsanto were not the only ones keen to have Asilons displayed next to their hi-fi audio systems. These next few Ceylons were just discovered this week. They date from 1953 and show that Ben had begun to explore the use of color in the Ocelonic forms by painting directly onto his black and white prints. Several techniques were attempted to render the Ocelons in color. The most effective technique involved the use of a color wheel rotating at a certain RPM between the camera lens and the oscilloscope screen. This technique had been invented by CBS for the earliest color television sets. Ben used the standard RGB color wheel and also experimented with various combinations of color filters. From the mid-1950s to the end of that decade, he experimented and photographed thousands of color oscillons. In 1960, the Sanford Museum debuted this new color collection, Dynamic Light Forms for the Space Age. The next set of slides is a small preview of the color oscillons. Throughout the 1960s, Ben continued to show his salons and license the images for commercial purposes. He continued to experiment with different ways in which to modulate the waveform. Some experiments involved connecting his turntable to the system and using the audio signal to generate oscillonic forms directly pushed by the music. He had spent some time visiting artists on the East Coast, like Mary Ellen Butte, and was inspired by her work's direct connection to the dynamics of music. Ben also began filming the Asilons in 16 millimeter as they were being created, but did not have the necessary means to continue with this new pursuit. At this point, almost 10,000 US dollars had been spent on building his custom system and darkroom facility. This would amount to around 90,000 US dollars today. An opportunity did arise for a collaboration with Experiments in Art and Technology, a nonprofit started by Bell Labs engineers and the artist Robert Rauschenberg. EAT was most well known for their series of nine evenings performances in 1966. EAT had welcomed Ben as a member in 1968 and exhibited Asilons in their group shows. They also facilitated collaboration around the U.S. between artists and engineers who were located in the same region. But a letter detailing the fact that they had no liaisons within a feasible distance of Cherokee, Iowa was very telling. Ben would remain his own engineer.
by the 1970s, computer art had shifted into the digital realm. The salons didn't appear in any new advertising or commercial applications. Ben's health and finances severely slowed down any new studio explorations of applying the Ocelonic forms to new media. The Ocelons would continue to be published in an art historical context, often appearing in the first few pages of computer art compilations, such as this one from Ruth Leavitt's Artist and Computer. The only feature from a noted art critic appeared in 1980 for Arts Magazine, decades after the Ocelons were widely exhibited. Ben was interviewed by Andrew Kagan, known for his extensive writing on Paul Clay and Marc Chagall. Kagan's aim was to present the Ocelons in a much larger post-war art historical context, paralleling Ben's development as an artist with someone from his same generation and also with Iowan roots, the abstract expressionist painter Jackson Pollock. Kagan states, Clearly, both of them were gripped by that new aesthetic awareness which emerged in this country after its victory in the Second World War. The sense that leadership in Western culture, as well as in industry and commerce, now belonged nowhere but here. The sense that culture was now something to be taken seriously by serious Americans. The sense of a need for a new, far-advanced pictorial language appropriate to our new cultural stature. Both men felt impelled to seek such forms through novel approaches of their own invention, approaches in which accident and chance played a large role, and in which form was discovered as much as it was created deliberately. Over the past 10 years, there's been a renewed interest in Ben's work. With the resurgence of modular synthesis as a means to create electronic music and visuals away from the digital realm, a new generation is discovering the forefathers of analog signal paths. In 2015, Scottish sound and visual artist Mark Lichen premiered an audiovisual performance called A Silan Response which used similar techniques to bands to create oscillography and music simultaneously. I see this as a continuation of Ben's creative lineage, as Ben always imagined having his work unfold in real time for the viewer and listener, but was never able to actualize this idea. I've known the composer and artist Robert Aiki Aubrey Lowe for many years, but it wasn't until I mentioned my Uncle Ben's custom analog systems in passing one day that Robert made the connection that Ben and I were, were related. Robert is well known in the modular synth community, and in 2016, he organized the Machines and Music Festival that took place around Brooklyn. I was invited to give a short talk on Ben's work and a collection of original Asilons that I had inherited were displayed at the festival and then later at the Control Mod Synth Shop in Williamsburg. In 2017, Robert curated a nested exhibition called Subject to Gesture, which was part of the Museum of Art and Design's larger exhibition, Sonic Arcade, Shaping Space with Sound. Sonic Arcade was a multi-component exhibition that explored how the ephemeral and abstract nature of sound is made material. A small grouping of Ben's Asilons were selected by Robert from the Sanford Museum's archive. Subject to Gesture's focus was on visual music and the interactive gestural aspect of analog synthesis. Uh, 
perfect place for these salons to be experienced. While researching the salons several years back, I came across a scientific paper from the University of Augsburg written by the physicist Sergei Denisov and A.V. Ponomarev. Ben's Asilons were studied through the lens of dynamic chaos theory by comparing a specific trio of Asilons to numerical models like the celebrated Rossler attractor. Physicists from the university concluded that Ben was able to observe chaotic attractors and other trademarks of nonlinear science as early as 1953. It would be almost a decade before noted mathematician, meteorologist, and chaos theory pioneer Edward Lorenz at MIT recognized them in his numerical models, and two more decades before an actual electronic circuit exhibited chaotic behavior when electrical engineer and computer scientist Leon Chua invented his seminal Chua circuit from standard components in 1983. I've been in correspondence with Professor Denisov after having recently discovered some of Ben's schematics and circuit diagrams in his notebooks, and we're hoping to recreate these circuits with simulation software to prove the hypothesis correct. The conclusion from Professor Denisov's research paper sums up Ben's brilliance. Our results give substantial evidence that Ben F. Leposky had all the ingredients needed to encounter chaotic regimes of analog electronic systems, and it is quite probable that he had witnessed these regimes while tuning the parameters of his mysterious circuits. Yet, science starts from problems and not from observations, so that even if our hypothesis is correct, Leposky cannot be nominated for the discovery of chaotic attractors although he certainly deserves to be mentioned in the curriculum vitae of electronic chaos. But what is most exciting about the Asilon story is that the use of pure aesthetic criteria, which guide artists' preferences, had led to the selection of several aperiodic chaotic attractor-like structures from more than 6,000 images, decades before scientists started to talk about the beauty of chaos. Thank you. Uh, for listening to my lecture. I wanted to leave you with a slideshow of Asilons, many of which uh, do not appear online in any form. Thank you to the Vector Hack Festival for this opportunity to share my research for the forthcoming book. Please drop me a line if you'd like to be notified when the book is published. A special thanks to Linda Burkhart and the Sanford Museum in Cherokee for the continued support of my book research. Thanks to my Uncle David, Ben's immediate nephew, for insights into Ben's life. And also a special thank you to my parents for never throwing anything out.
Hi, my name is Benjamin Heidesberger, and I would like to talk about vector graphics before digital computers, which my father performed in the 50s and 60s. bestanden Pate bei dieser Maschinerie, die der Wolfsburger Fotograf Heinrich Heidersberger nach den Gesetzen der Schwerkraft entwickelte. Ein System von ineinandergreifenden Pendeln und Gewichten erzeugt Bewegungen, deren Sinn es ist, einen Lichtpunkt zu lenken. Eine eingebaute Kamera setzt den Weg dieses Lichtpunktes in fotografische Rhythmogramme um, deren Schwingungen an erstarrte tänzerische Bewegungen erinnern. Im unruhigen Wandern eines Lichtpunktes verschmelzen auf geheimnisvolle Weise Zufall und menschlicher Impuls und aus physikalischen Gesetzmäßigkeiten entsteht ein neues Formelement unserer Zeit. So, uh, first I want to talk a little bit about my father, uh, Heinrich Heidersberger. Uh, here you see him uh, at the age about 50. Um, here you see him, well, he actually became 100 years before he died in 2006. Here you see him at the age of 96 in front of his workshop. Uh, in his later years, he even switched over to digital photography and he was a gifted tinkerer, I had a huge workshop and built a lot of stuff. The stations of his life, he was born in Ingolstadt in 1906, grew up in Linz, uh, Austria, and then uh, moved to the Guards for a while to study architecture. In 1928, he moved to Paris to become a painter and attended the uh, Académie Moderne by, from, from Fernand Léger. Um, and he stayed about three years in Paris. After that, he moved to Den Haag, uh, where he met his first wife. They married and eventually moved to Copenhagen in Denmark. In 1936, uh, he was coming back to Germany um, as all people living abroad were threatened to lose their citizenship if they don't come back to Germany. So he also did that and started to become interested in architectural photography. Um, in the Second World War, he lived in Salzgitter Lehmstedt in the steelworks there, where he was head of the photographic department of the Hermann Göring Reichswerke. After the Second World War, he moved to Braunschweig and eventually in 61, he was invited by the city of Wolfsburg to have his atelier in the castle, which is the name giver of the city of Wolfsburg. Here we see um, like an overview of his work. So there's a more journalistic reportage work than of course the standard in the industry and advertisement. The rhythmograms, which are the part, which are really the, the, the main thing of this lecture. Um, in 49, he did a pretty courageous, courageous uh, work with his mood. So he projected um, rasters on women's bodies and it's called dress of light. Um, he was quite famous for his architectural photography. And actually I would say he's one of the leading architects of German photography, architecture photography after Second World War. And he did a lot of experiments uh, like snowflakes and macro photography. Um, his work can be found in all over the world in different collections. I have some here, the San Francisco MoMA, the New York MoMA, which bought some of his rhythmograms, the Lentos in Linz, uh, where the Ars Electronica is also happening the German Historical Museum, uh, Berlin Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz, which takes care of a lot of the German heritage stuff, uh, Sammlung Peter C. Rupert in Cologne, Saal Oppenheim, Munich, uh, Schuppmann, Kunstmuseum in Wolfsburg, and uh, 
the latest thing is in Bologna where the Collezione Must is showing industrial photography. Here you see some of his paintings. This is uh, 29 in Paris. Um, his style was very close to De Chirico's. Um, you see a lot of electrical wires here, the typical shadows for surrealists and this kind of dystopian architecture landscape in a way. In 48, he painted this uh, painting called The Birth of Thoughts. It's quite interesting that these loop-like figures already can be found in, in, the, in, the, in the paintings way before he did the rhythmograms, which were basically photography. Um, here you see him in the typical pose of a photographer. The camera is pointed at the mirror. He bought this camera on the flea market. Uh, this was in 28, so he was like uh, 22 at the age. Uh, he bought a Leica camera later and was uh, one of the first uh, photographers actually to use a Leica. This is some uh, puppet heads in, in Den Haag in Holland. Um, and this is a pretty famous photograph by him. Uh, it's in Copenhagen. Uh, Lederstrede, which still exists exactly the same way as it is uh, photographed here. You see the long shadows of the bikers here bringing stuff from A to B. Uh, and he took, took the photograph of the, uh, from in, out of the window of the third floor of his apartment there. Snow crystals, like we all know Bentley. Bentley did uh, like 5,000 snowflakes uh, under a microscope and developed some kind of a system to put them all in there. My father had about 300, also developed his own microscope with a flash. And uh, there's a huge variety of snowflakes in his work to be found. This is electrical discharge from 1959. The interesting thing about these discharge things is that you don't need a camera and a lens. So the, the flash draws its own picture on the photographic plate and you de just develop it without any lens between the object and the, and the photo plate. This is a dandelion. Um, so he was pretty good actually at this kind of more graphical um, Macro photography did a quite quite many for a, a mural. Coming to his architectural photography, so this is his kind of style: uh, black and white, mainly constructed. Uh, um, he was taking his time to take the photographs, so usually spent a week or something in a small trailer and lived there, and saw how the light develops over days. This picture is quite marvelous because there was a puddle in front of him. So it's a small piece of water actually, which mirrors the, the, the building so that it gets this spherical shape. Um, also the clouds are not from this image, it's from another, uh, it's from a collection of his, of clouds. So it's, it's all constructed and uh, he did that pretty well. This is probably his most famous uh, picture. It's the power plant of the Volkswagen factory from 1971 in Wolfsburg. It, it shows the Wirtschaftswunder at its fullest somehow, uh, the factory um, and this image, this picture is kind of an identification picture for the city of Wolfsburg between the city, which is on the other side of the canal and the factory itself like half of the population in Wolfsburg work at Volkswagen. So it's the main thing there. So coming now to the rhythmograms. Um, my father was commissioned to make a mural for the uh, Ostfalia University in Wolfenbüttel. And it happened that he bought this uh, book that you probably know quite well. It's uh, Felix Auerbach, Physik und Grafischen Darstellung. And it lists basically all the graphical outputs from physical experiments quite beautifully. Auerbach studied with Humboldt, with, uh, with um, Helmholtz and Kirchhoff and was an important guy at the time. Um, 
as you saw already, uh, the rhythmograms are basically Lusatian figures. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Jules Antonin uh, Lusatian, French physicist, 1822 to 1880. Um, he was the one who developed these later called Lusatian figures to measure the the relation of two frequencies and probably invented the harmonograph, which we will see in a moment. It's interesting, I mean, history is not fair, but there was an US American mathematician, physicist and astronomer, Nathaniel Bowditch, who described the same phenomenon about 40 years earlier, but uh, Lissajou is the one we remember today. This is the harmonograph uh, on the right side. You see two pendula, um, which are swinging perpendicular to each other and on top is a drawing, like a pencil drawing instrument, which draws the movement directly on paper. And on the left, you see some of the outputs. Um, here we see some Lissajou systems, projection system. The top left is uh, two tuning forks, uh, which deflect the point of light from this kind of oil lamp, whatever it is. Uh, there are small mirrors mounted on the tuning forks. They are also um, perpendicular to each other. And the guy looking through this telescope is watching the point of light from the lamp and see the deflection. Below that, you see a projection system. Uh, you have two mirrors swinging in these uh, wires there. And the light going through them is projected on, on a wall. And it's already quite neat because you don't have to look through a telescope. And on the right side, this is even a little bit more developed. Uh, so you have a suit on a glass plate and two pendula draw uh, a line uh, in that suit and the projection. So the, the, the glass gets clear at, in this line and you can easily project that. One thing I really like is this sort of pendulum installation, which I did a lot in exhibitions of my father's work. We have a single pendulum here, which has two built-in lengths, L dot and L. Um, if you move that pendulum in the, in the, in the, um, like the screen moves, like the screen, um, it's only L dot long. And if you move, move that per perpendicular to the screen, it's L long. So you have, you can actually implement two frequencies in this, X and Y, Z axis, and uh, we see something. Um, this is the uh, pendulum. Uh, it's a UV LED that draws with light directly on fluorescent paper, and you already get this nice, beautiful harmonic movement, uh, which you can actually watch forever, I can do at least. So coming back to the mural, um, Heinrich Hadesberger said, I combined some rhythmograms with other physical and technical pictures for a photo mural that was not only supposed to decorate the entrance of an engineering school, but also try to connect the physical, technical with the beautiful. So that's like really an artistic, uh, scientific, artistic approach. And he used that quite a bit in his work. Um, he was photo, he was filmed several times in Wochenschauen in, in uh, like these newsreels. As a kid, I saw that, was of course quite proud uh, going to the cinema and seeing my father there on the screen. Wie sehr die Technik auf Formen beruht, die in der Modernität sind oder umgekehrt, zeigen die Arbeiten des Braunschweiger Fotografen Heinrich Heidersberger. Es sind Aufnahmen magnetischer Kraftfelder, Rhythmogramme, Industrie- und Architekturfotografien. Es ist Heidersberger, der von der Malerei herkommt, um die Aufdeckung des Ästhetischen in den Formen, wie sie überall zu finden und aufzudecken sind. And they're standing in front of that mural at the Ostfalia in Wolfenbüttel, and he explained that to the journalist. Ein Kugellager. Und 
ein künstlicher Blitz. Eine Montage aus Negativ und Positiv bringt den optischen Reiz moderner Industrieformen verstärkt zum Ausdruck. Diese Aufnahmen finden zunehmend Verwendung in der modernen Gebrauchsgrafik. Die Perspektive zylindrischer Formen oder die Polarität in der Architektur sind ebenso reizvoll wie ein ganz einfaches Straßenpflaster. Für seine Rhythmogramme konstruierte Heidersberger eine Maschine, mit der er einen Lichtpunkt bewegt, der je nach Einstellung rhythmische Bewegung in unendlicher Vielfalt auf fotografische Platten zeichnen kann. So this again is a, a photograph of the mural. Um, it's about 15 meters long, still existing. Uh, here you see it flattened out. So there's the different fields of the uh, university, like magnet magnetism, perspective, gears, uh, wind tunnel, telecommunication, biology, Uh, and so on and so on. And he needed a graphical element to combine these different um, photographs. So uh, he came upon these Lissajou figures and uh, started to develop the rhythmograms. Here you see him again in front of the machine. Uh, this is like the third version of the machine. It's already like a steel construction or, or aluminum construction. In his workshop, he developed all these individual components with help of people. This rectangular box there is a camera with the uh, 9x12 photo plate, and he's just adjusting something there. So the rhythmogram consists of four coupled pendula in a metal frame. It's about three by six by 2.5 meters. The core element is a surface mirror and a point of light. Um, it's also a machine sculpture. It has a very sculptural quality with his own construction language, uh, which you can see if you visit the thing. Basically, it's a mechanical analog computer. It's, this is important because uh, analog computers had, had their high times in the 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe 70s, but already uh, electronic ones. This is a mechanical analog computer. And he developed between 1953 and 1965 about 300 different um, rhythmograms, which we have in the archive. The archive in general has about 130,000 pictures, and 75% of it is architectural photography. So the four pendula, um, I, I name them P1 through P4. Um, each pendulum has four adjustable. Um, parameters. One is the amplitude. So by shifting the coupling element around the pivot point, you can uh, um, influence how much of that pendulum goes into the result. You can adjust the phase. There's an electromagnetic trigger, with, which, which is triggered by the large pendulum. So the large pendulum P4 triggers one P1, P2, and P3. Um, the weight in each pendulum can be shifted, and so you can adjust the frequency. Uh, it's in the kind of basic configuration. It's uh, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, and 16 seconds. Damping is possible to adjust if you put in some paper or something, so the resistance to air uh, increases. And if you start the machine, it takes about 10 minutes uh, to come to a rest and to finish the rhythmogram. Here I, I try to describe with certain formulas uh, the, the different uh, uh, pendulum influences on the result. So there's some summation by two summations by two pendula. Uh, you can adjust certain coefficient, coefficients. Um, and the mirror basically does panning and tilting. Uh, and this is all described in here. And once the photoplate is uh, 
is ready, uh, it's developed, and then you can start to use photographic methods to change the, the results. During the exposure of the photo plate, of course, you can do some stuff, like you can switch on and off the light. We will see that a little bit later, or you can dim the light, which means that you get like a Z modulation of the, uh, of the light. Then you can do the cl classical positive negative uh, procedure. Solarization is a reversal of black and white during by, by exposing uh, the photo plate with light uh, while it's developed. And it's a quite nice process because it gets this 3D image character. You can zoom in. And of course, you can mount several rhythmograms on a, on a final result. Here you can see the machine in a film that we made. I will play this film and you will see the different elements of the uh, machine. So this is the trigger switch. Um, Bernd is pressing this switch. And what you can see, this telephone relays release the pendulum, large pendulum, the six meter pendulum, and this large pendulum bringing in here into the picture releases the under, other pendula and it's controllable by uh, in, their, in their face through these uh, switches that can be sliding uh, back and forth between uh, the ends of this uh, plate. So once all four pendula swing, um, the movement of the individual pendula is zoomed up, as I described in the formulas. You can see certain details of the machine. It's quite an intricate, uh, intricate thing. And this is, for example, a zooming point uh, of two pendula into a, a third one. This is like the bearing of a large pendulum. It's two fire blades, uh, which is of course hardened steel. All the colors are also original on my father. This is the smallest pendulum, and you can see a little bit the uh, thread in there, which allows for the adjustment of the length here. So it's like uh, ears that translate the horizontal into vertical movement. Parts like from a sailing ship. Here is adjustable length. And this is like uh, the final uh, collecting of all the individual movements on this uh, surface mirror as I described. And it's uh, panning and tilting. And here you see the point of light uh, as it looks when it, the photo plate is, is exposed. The machine again, uh, band is going there and starts it again. You see a little bit the size. Uh, we built up that machine uh, in Wolfsburg, in one of our rooms there. And if you ever come there, you're invited to see it live across the archive.
it takes a lot of tuning and uh, tweaking to get good rhythmograms. So uh, I would say he couldn't have done more than one or two per night. So I'm going now through like 15 different rhythmograms, describe them a little bit. I sorted them by archive numbers. So the early ones we see first and the later ones later. And there's a certain development in them, which I would also describe. So this is one of the early rhythmograms, probably in a, uh, like 53, 54. Uh, this is positive. So the, the uh, point of light makes a dark line on the photo plate. And if you put that in large, that you get white lines again. Uh, looks a little bit like computer graphics. As I said, it's a mechanical analog computer. One of the simple ones, but I find very beautiful, also pretty early. Uh, it's two rhythmograms put together, actually. So uh, the, the frequency frequency uh, of the background, the round one is almost one by one, and the other one is a little bit different, and so he put two uh, on each other. This is the one I grew up with. Uh, it's part of a furniture that my father made, and the sliding doors have a black and white um, rhythmogram, this and the reverse one. Uh, it's getting a little bit more wild now, uh, so leaving the pure symmetries. This is all, all, already one that I that I described before. It's the, called the solarization. Uh, and you see where the lines come together to make a dark image. Uh, the solarization process makes that white, and you get this uh, 3D effect. This is called the Scottish flag. Um, here he switched off uh, the... Uh, the light for several um, oscillations, and it's forming this, what he calls, Scottish flag. Um, this is quite famous rhythmogram by him because he got the silver medal at the Milano Triennale in 1957, the year I was born, and that's why it's called Triennale. Uh, this is a rhythmogram from the... Um, uh, like in the middle of his development. Interesting thing is this was bought by a local TV station in federal, a local, uh, state TV station in in Germany, the Südwestfunk, and they formed that into this kind of uh, broadcasting logo and used that between 1956 and 68. Um, by tweaking, as I said, you eventually find out how you can uh, have all these different shapes. So what he actually did was uh, started to draw uh, letters. So this is the letter H, like Heidelsberger. And he used that for his stationery uh, for many years. And this is also uh, the letter R uh, for my mother's name, Renata. Um, here we see a solarization again, um, also a little bit asymmetric, uh, which, I mean, the, the, the simple shapes, shapes tend a little, little bit to be boring, and I find this asymmetry is quite nice. This is Trizion, like uh, the element, and uh, here he regularly switched off the light, like every second, or every tenth oscillation, and getting these uh, interruptions in the in the shape. Another um, solarization. Uh, here are two copied on each other. Um, one of the latest ones. So he started to uh, deconstruct actually the rhythmograms uh, by switching off the, the light at almost uh, random points in time. This is called the knot. This is all, all already like chaotic. Uh, the, the relation of the frequencies are not simple anymore. And so you get this kind of uh, rhythmograms. And uh, he did some experiments combining rhythmograms with, uh, with uh, like sculptures. 
This is the Lawakon group and the uh, rhythmogram in the, in the background, which is also prospectively projected on the ground, is uh, a, a rhythmogram called Dolphin, which has a similar shape like the Lawakon group. And he also put these lines in there in this, I would say, cyberspace uh, picture. Um, my father met um, Jean Cocteau uh, in France um, through a common friend, Eric Hesselberg, who was the captain of the Contiki. And uh, Cocteau uh, wrote a very beautiful letter to my father, like uh, an artistic description of the rhythmograms. I read that the admirable rhythmograms by Heidelberg are proof that chance does not exist for the poet, or better, that he gave it a different name. The link of man and machine seems to be a mark of the times. Let's admire even if we cannot understand. That is the only way to escape the darkness of the Cartesian worldview. Uh, we have the letter in the archive and uh, it's like very cooked to and uh, handwriting. Here we see my father in 55 uh, opening an exhibition at the Council for Design um, he's the guy uh, here in, in front, uh, and uh, yeah, it's like uh, showing a little bit the situation at the time. Talking about contemporaries, of course, my father was not the only one uh, working in, in, in such a field. Um, I want to show like uh, three examples of other artists doing similar stuff at the same time or different, like almost the same time. The left is Peter Kittmann, the photographer, who also did some famous work in Wolfsburg. Um, it's, um, then we have uh, Herbert W. Franke, um, together with a colleague, Franz Reimann. He used uh, an oscilloscope screen as the output of his um, oscillations. And this is like the, the center rhythmogram. And um, Umbo, Otto Umber, uh, he also did some stuff. And it's, um, as we have seen, it's, it's not that, that difficult if you make uh, simple rhythmograms with like a pendulum, thread pendulum, it's, it's uh, easy. In Umbo's case, we don't know exactly from which year it is because all his archive was born some, in, some, somewhere in, in the past. Um, Funny thing is, we already did an exhibition in Rijeka some time ago, uh, which is Mediascape. And on the right side, um, uh, you see uh, a book by Andrew Witt. Andrew Witt uh, is uh, at Harvard and also working for, at the time, working for Gehrig Technology and was very interested in the kind of rhythmograms as inspiration for freeform architecture. So he made this book with a nice classification system. Um, when I was about, um, let's say 20, um, a little bit earlier actually, um, I thought I'm a little bit more clever than my father and uh, what, whatever he did with this huge machine, I can do uh, smaller in electronics. So I developed this uh, analog, uh, electronic computer. It consists of three pendula, which are simulated by filters, uh, oscillating filters, which is the three things on the left side. Uh, then you have the summing amplifier, a multiplier, clock generator, and the power supply. The good thing about this is that it, you can manipulate it real time. So you can try to find out what, what means what. If you tune the thing, it's, it's all quite interactive, uh, differently from my father's machine, which you always have to wait for the result. Uh, the bad thing is, of course, the lines are not so fine. It's an oscilloscope output. And, uh, um, but you, you can actually do a lot in, in uh, different fields with it. Um, this is like the most simple output of such an analog co uh, computer is two decaying oscillations of the same frequency uh, phase shifted by 90 degrees, which is the inherent quality of such a filter. 
But if you put that on an XY um, oscilloscope screen, you get this spiral. Here we see some of my recent stuff. Uh, this is all running through some color synthesizer and uh, uh, different things. Um, it's an ongoing project, so this was just a test for uh, the, the, the kind of uh, manipulation possibilities that I have now. And together with uh, two film musicians, I'm working on a project. Uh, they, they will do the ambient uh, music with Eurorack and I will do the visuals and we wanna make like public performances. The most important thing for this project is there's a direct interactivity between the music and uh, the images. So that's like this old dream uh, Skriabin and lots of people were pursuing is uh, how, how, can, how can there be a synesthetic uh, combination of different outputs like uh, color and music or shapes and music and so on. And we're planning for public performances in 21, 22. So thanks a lot. Um, I invite you to come to Wolfsburg. Um, please mail me before you come. I live in Berlin and Wolfsburg is like an hour from here. We are there in the castle, extremely beautiful. Uh, Wolfsburg has some interesting things to see. There's a, the Kunstmuseum, the Feno is a, is a famous building by Zaha Hadid. Uh, and in the castle are some cultural institutions. Um, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, thank you for the chance to present. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Hey, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, no problem. We're still going to wait and see if uh, Benjamin and Bant will uh, will join us, but okay. um, it looks to me like we are live on cam on YouTube uh, with the Vector Hack 2020, the second day of the presentations. Um, We've got Scooby Leposki here. We are waiting for Benjamin Heidesberger and perhaps Bant Rodrian to, to join us um, to talk about their presentation. But um, Scooby, since you're here, <laughs> let's just yeah. do it, man. Sure. Thank you so much. That was, I mean, that was just absolutely incredible. The, the, the stuff you had found there, the, the, the chat was like on fire. People wanted to know all kinds of crazy stuff. So we're gonna bring you some questions from them in okay. a little while. Um, but really, I mean, it's such uh, such uh, such a labor of love, really, to to dump to just jump in there and and start looking for these things. Um, what what was your like really? What was your first experience with this stuff? When did you realize who this person was? Um, well, I actually, I knew Ben when I was uh, growing up. Um, he uh, he had, he only lives um, one block from my grandmother's house, and I always wondered why Uncle Ben never was invited to. Thanksgiving and Christmas, even though I knew his house was so close. Um, I still haven't figured that out. Um, but it's probably because my grandma was a uh, pretty, a fairly conservative, devout Catholic and Ben's life and, you know, his, his uh, interests were so foreign to her. Um, but I knew about Ben's work, um, just going to the Sanford Museum as a kid, I was like, you know, into dinosaurs and archaeology, and I would go there. And at that time in the 1980s, they had a, like a, a little section of the museum that was like a permanent uh, mini exhibition of his at Silons. And I'm like, oh, that's that's my name there, who you know. And like, and I asked my my dad, like, oh, I saw Uncle Ben's work at the museum. Um, 
so I knew Ben is this kind of mysterious fi like family figure uh, growing up and my only kind of like reference was like, uh, I remember seeing Back to the Future with you know with Michael J. Fox and he would go to see Doc Brown. And to me, Uncle Ben was kind of like the Doc Brown. And I remember going to pick up some art supplies from Ben at his apartment um, when I was probably 10 and Ben was pretty private. So he kind of opened the door to his apartment and I could see over his shoulder, all of his equipment. And I'm like, wow, Uncle Ben's just like, you know, kind of mad scientist doing this stuff. And I think at that point he was already kind of had phased out of doing all of his, you know, he wasn't prolific at that point, but he still had his equipment there. Um, so yeah, so as a kid, I knew about Ben's work, but it wasn't until I was in graduate school studying, um, getting a master's in art as well and using kind of hacking like like early like robotic kits to do, to do mechanical drawings myself. Ben and I, um, you know, would talk about uh, my work and then he would talk about some of the ideas he had when he was doing his thing. Um, so it just took me to maturing as a, as an artist and a person that Ben and I could, uh, could talk, you know, and relate. Um, and I think I saw him probably a few years uh, before he passed away. We had some really great conversations. And at that, that point he was living, uh, he, had let, he had moved out of that apartment building that he'd spent 60 years in and was living in a, like a you know like assisted living um and even then when he was probably in his 80s he was talking about getting a, a computer to see like maybe there's something he could figure out like something new so yeah it was like uh I, you know i think up until the very end he still was thinking about new new ideas great great that's i was just thinking um, I was I was actually just trying to look up really quickly here um, uh, another artist, um, but d yeah, just these um, these 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 stories about trying to kind of um, get in touch with people, you know, sometimes in the really last years of their lives, in order to find out uh, the deeper story, to really get in there and, and and learn a little bit more than than what the archives present or or what the history books present is is really quite interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on on hold for a second here, and I'm gonna greet Benjamin Heidesberger Hi. joining us from Wolfsburg. Thank you for thank you for for coming in and uh, taking some time to talk with us. This was also a really fascinating uh, presentation, and the the amount of um, the amount of sheer engineering genius that went into making these these pendulum things um, impressed me and certainly impressed a lot of the people who are watching on the YouTube stream as well. And so I'm sure that they're going to have some some questions for you about that. I want to mention at this point that there um, there should have been a third panelist, um, uh, James Nolan Gandhi, who is very um, very involved in also making incredible mechanical drawing machines. Um, uh, James has a background in uh, as a machinist, and he's brought that background as a machinist into the construction of these very elaborate machines that he makes um, one-off mechanical drawings with. Um, unfortunately, they're a combination of some um, technical details in getting the talk to us, and I think a, some kind of dental accident that happened to him uh, yesterday means that he's going to join us a little bit later. He's going to, um, hopefully, we'll be able to bring him in um, next weekend for the closing uh, events in Dubrovnik that will also be streamed. So our conversation today will be with Scooby and Benjamin. Benjamin, is um, Bant going to join us or, or not? Well, uh... Um, because the, the, the time shifted somehow, he, uh, he has some other appointment with his family. He might join, uh, he just drops in. If not, it's okay, I can also do that. I mean, like we, we cooperate uh, with the Institute. So he's like the curator and the head of the Institute and I'm the general manager of the Institute. Of course, I also know my father's work quite well and uh, I, can, I think I can give qualified answers. If you could, um, because it didn't get covered so much in your presentation, maybe you could talk just a second more about what Bant's role in the project is, please. Well, you, the, the, the story goes like this. My father is um, interesting enough because he, he got 100 years and five weeks before he died. He had a very long um, life covering the 20th century. And he's 50 years older than me. And that's quite a jump in generations. Uh, Eventually, when he was like 95 or 90, he was getting a little bit unsure because he didn't get any pension what to do in his old age and uh, eventually decided to sell all his stuff to a foundation. 
And I saw this contract and said, don't do that, I'll buy it from you now. And this is how the whole story began. And uh, so um, it's quite, I mean, then I convinced the city of Wolfsburg to support this project. And I have to say that they give us a reasonable amount of money every year since 20 years, which is fabulous. And so we have a really beautiful institute with a climate chamber, it's black and white photography, it's good if it at a certain temperature and so on. And so we are quite privileged actually. And of course, I mean, I'm artist myself. I did a lot of stuff in interactive media, television and so on. And to have uh, another artist in the family is quite close, maybe too close somehow. So I was very happy to find Bernd, uh, who was at the time uh, working in Cologne. And um, we kind of started to work together and eventually it's like almost like a marriage after 20 years. Um, he's doing the daily work at the Institute, uh, uh, going to Wolfsburg every day. I live in Berlin and so we have this divided role. My, my job is to get the money and all the general stuff going and his role is the more content wise uh, and uh, He's on one side, he's an electrical engineer and on the other side, he studied photography. So it's a, it's a quite co good combination. And uh, so this is like the nature of how we work together. Then we have another woman who knows, I mean, 130,000 pictures is a lot. And uh, so we have a woman that knows quite well where to find what photography and how this is all sorted. Uh, it's between 1940 and 1980 that the active phase of my father was and uh, of course there's some like interns and bookkeeping and so on so it's a like like a small uh, but working institution for photography it's uh it makes my um with my other hat on as a conservator it makes okay. me very happy to hear about all of this work being looked after yeah yeah i mean you, you know how things are there are so many especially in photography there's so much around and so much just thrown out, decaying, yeah. uh, landing on the dump somewhere. And uh, I think my father was quite happy that I'll do the job, I'd at least initiate it. And uh, this is how the whole story started. And as I said, I mean, the rhythmograms are just a small part of that uh, work. And there's like, for example, the snowflakes are also super interesting, uh, but that's another field. Or mac macro photography, you did a lot of, of insects enlargements and so on. And, but uh, yeah, the rhythmograms are the thing. It's, uh, it's interesting to me because I actually found your work first, Benjamin, through my interest in um, video synthesis. Yeah. And then found your father's work. And also, uh, because I'm always researching all of this sort of stuff, I have an things like early computer art and generative photography. And there's yeah. like a real combination of links there. And then Scooby with Ben's work, I think there's like really strong parallels um in terms of like shape, shape, shape wise and also family story i found that quite interesting when i heard your presentation i mean like uh, i was was your uncle right uh my great uncle great uncle yeah yeah i mean my father he comes from a totally different world my my grandfather was a, a high official in the austrian uh, hungarian army and uh, he, he, in Germany, we have these two different forms how to address someone, which is you, which can be uh, the personal one and the impersonal one. And he was still talking to his parents in the impersonal one, you know, and it's, it's like really a different world and a different uh, background. But uh, he was very early uh, radio amateur, uh, did all sort of stuff, uh, was always interested in technology. But it's it, like the family story I found very touching, Scooby. And uh, let me know if your book is out. Yes, I it will do. I think there was a lot of interest in the chat about when the uh, when the book drops, when the book drops. So uh, that's good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, I... Well, what, excuse me. One thing I have to say is it's, that's probably in, in, to a certain amount also the case with Lopovsky is History is not fair. I mean, like there are people doing incredible stuff. And like my father was a totally solitary guy. I mean, he hardly spoke to anybody uh, because he was just into his work. He had his paradise in the castle. He had organized everything 
and he was simply not interested to talk to stupid people. And so, of course, he never developed this kind of network and and stuff. And and of course, got a little bit bitter in the end, uh, which I hopefully reversed a little bit when he saw that there was really recognition coming in. Yeah. That kind of ties into a question that I had that I actually I asked some of the presenters a bit about yesterday. I've, um, we work in this very networked era now where it's very easy kind of no matter where you're located to to really tie into different people doing similar things and 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 uh, Benjamin and, and Ben both they, they were working in a very different world and, and uh, Scooby you even started by showing how physically isolated in, in between the cultural coasts uh, uh, yeah. Ben was so, um, and and it's interesting, Benjamin, um, to hear about your father because he also. You, uh, I was going to ask exactly that, like how networked was he? How aware of of other artists was he uh, when he was working? So I would put that question to both of you. Is uh, uh, Benjamin? You talked about it a little bit with some networking, and and um, Scooby, you talked about um, Ben meeting Mary Ellen Butte that we had a really wonderful presentation about last time. But how, how more networked were they? Um, the, the collaborations with EAT from, from Ben Leposky must have been really something for him. Um, yeah, actually, uh, when I first started the book, I was, it was more of um, Ben's position was more of a mystery because I hadn't discovered all of like the correspondence. And Ben was just really, uh, he archived everything. So I have all the letters. Um, like facsimiles of what he wrote, and then the you know the re the response letters, and he was in touch um, with everyone at the time. Like you know Herbert Franke in Germany, they had like there was like many letters um, about each other's ideas, and then and then he was um, in close contact with Georgi Keeps, you know at MIT, uh, and you know many people, and, and it just made me think about um, what you just mentioned that now you can find people with just hashtagging the 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 right thing you know um but for ben it's uh like now if this were to happen you know there's not any written letters so i'm fortunate that ben uh was working at a time when to network you meant physically writing to someone um and then having you know there's like a a written record of all of his uh all of his correspondence and i actually learned probably the most about him as an artist from just uh, him replying to people when they're inquiring about, you know, do you want to write this article for us? And then he's like, actually, no, I have this other, this other thing, like his radio electronics uh, article. Um, and then when he wrote uh, to the editor at Micronotes, he was talking about his idea of this triangle of form. So, um, you know, being in Cherokee, like it's a small, uh, it's a small farming community still. And when Ben was, uh, was working, it was probably 7,000 people. Um, and the closest university was still three hours away, but Ben managed to just write to everyone um, to see if they could send him information. Like he just wrote to uh, the, the Vincent Schaefer about how, you know, how to capture snowflakes in polymers. And, um, and he just reached out to everyone. If he found out about someone through, I think he learned about EAT uh, through a time, like a Times Magazine article. And he wrote to the Times, do you have information on this group? And then he sent them his, you know, his uh, brochure and some samples of Asilons. And then, you know, it was in line with what they were doing. So then they contacted him. So that's great. That's great. And Benjamin, how, how in contact with others um, was your father during his era? Was he really kind of the, the lone genius in, in the studio there? Well, I think that changed over time. I mean, like <clears throat> he did this, of course, I mean, like, if, if you have ever seen this uh, movie, Midnight in Paris, this is exactly the situation he experienced in Paris, staying there in Montmartre for three years. And he met them all, Miller and, and the, the surrealists, the painters, and that inspired him a lot. Uh, and later on, because he was really a well-known architectural photographer, he was quite... Uh, well received with architects, but that's a totally different field somehow. Uh, then he uh, he had this connection um, to Heyerdahl uh, with this Contiki uh, thing. Erik Hesselberg, he was the, the captain of uh, the Contiki. He was the only one who could really steer a ship actually and, and work with the sextant. And so 
he was a close friend of my father. And so they visited him at the Côte d'Azur and he met Cocteau there and all the other guys uh, at the time. But for some reason, um, uh, that did, didn't really follow up to something. I mean, I think he would develop into this I mean, genius is always an over uh, little word, maybe too strong, but he developed really into this lonely guy who uh, who was totally self-motivated. Uh, he was an autodidact. He was never he never learned something from a school really, except his short study at in Graz and with architecture and so on. And I find that really interesting how much a person can really draw out of himself or like by reading something or like, yeah, like this book, Felix Auerbach, look at how much he, he made out of that single book. I mean, which came accidentally to him, you know, he bought it from a guy who sells old books and he saw it and thought, wow, this is really interesting. We still have the book. There's, there's such a great tradition in all of the electronic arts of, of the autodidact. And the, the story that I always tell when I'm lecturing is, is about David Tudor. Who, um, who was a, you know, he was an avant-garde pianist until, until the late 60s, the early 70s. And then he decided he was so sick of the piano, he never wanted to look at it again, essentially. And he locked himself in his, um, in his woodshed, let's say, or in his studio with uh, stacks of popular electronics magazines. And he taught himself making circuits from there. And that's a really strong connection between both of the artists that, that you've presented on today is that they were both um, very self-motivated. They were both autodidacts and they they both um, uh, not only produced uh, the, produced works, but they produced these amazing machines um, that, uh, that there's, they there's one point, to document. There's one point I would like to come back. That's the hashtag. Um, because I mean, of course, also, uh, I mean, I like I curated a big festival two years ago in Stuttgart about uh, developed technology or developing a whole area uh, technology wise. And uh, one, one thing where one has to be aware of that all this digital internet stuff that you can find with, with a hashtag basically also creates a filter bubble a filter bubble that that keeps certain people out of the out of the canon i would say the art canon and that does not allow others to come in because i mean the art market is not fair the art world is not fair and and of course that's also why i'm very uh, find it very nice to present here is that i see a chance to reach totally different people because we are coming from a photography background and uh, reaching out into this totally other world of generative stuff. I, I mentioned this yesterday, and I'll, I'll mention it again. Is that it's? I think one of the one of the, the the chief faults when you work in in the arts is is to exactly think that you're the genius alone in the studio, and that there's and there's no context, there's no previous context for what you're doing, and nobody else is thinking the way you're thinking, and it's. Um, for, for a lot of people, it really opens their eyes. There's a couple of people, again, in the chat that um, it's their first exposure to, to some of these works. They've been working in very different things for a long time, um, but they, they've been very related. And then they all of a sudden they see that there's this huge history behind it, which is, which is absolutely, um, it's, it's marvelous. And it, it does, it really opens up and uh, both, the, both the art market and the gallery scene and academia both have this kind of, um, these walls and that uh, that are very hard to cross sometimes. And okay, um, I might come back to questions about equipment in a little while. I've, I wanted to I wanted to ask uh, you, Benjamin, one thing in particular because um, Scooby talked about it um, very well. You know, uh, Scooby, you said that um, like your your relationship with Ben really started to blossom and you started to really learn a lot when you came into your own as as a mature artist. And uh, Benjamin, you're um, you're you obviously uh, you've known your father your whole life. You've known him under a lot of different contexts. You didn't discover him as the the strange great uncle behind the apartment door or something like that. Uh, my father's also an artist, and I understand this relationship of the of the family. Let's say, um, do, do you feel? I mean, not to say not necessarily to say were you working under your father's shadow, but do you feel like this was an influence over you in the development of your own work? Um. First of all, my father left at eight in the morning and came back around eight or nine in the evening. 
and as I said, uh, my mother is 30 years younger than my father, so it's a, it's a very complex family situation. Um, both my, my mother is actress, my father is this photographer, and uh, I'm very thankful for the kind of inspiration I get, got from them. But um, that's also something that you have to, um, that you have to earn somehow. It's, it's, uh, it's not, that's not coming freely. Like I particularly never liked, to be honest, never liked my father's rhythmogram so much um, because I couldn't understand them at the time. And I found it boring that it's photography and it's also old fashioned and Actually, then there was this moment when I decided um, what he did mechanically, I can also do electronically and I'm kind of killing my father in a way, you know, by building this machine. And, uh, and that kind of, he pay, actually paid for it. It was quite expensive, all the components at the time. I was a young guy with no money. And uh, so I did that. And I think he was pretty proud what I did. And that opened, of course, a door for me to uh, get closer to him. Uh, and eventually by buying this old, this all this archive and setting up a cooperation to work on that also gave, gave me a chance to say thank you to my father for the kind of inspiration that I got from him. And uh, yeah, so that's like, uh, it was not an easy beginning, but I'm quite happy how it worked out eventually. That's that's really wonderful to kind of come back around. It's yeah. I guess, always this, uh, you know, there's there's a battle for a little while, and then you kind of reconcile the thing and uh, and, and change it around. I know a lot of of sons and daughters of famous artists that suffer a lot, and I have to say I don't. <laughs> bravo, bravo. <laughs> Scooby, I want to I want to pull you in here for a second. Um, is uh, obviously the, the the work of Heinrich Heidesberger has been um, let's say well preserved in the sense that the machine is it exists. It's in a it's in a climate controlled room. You can go and push a button and turn the thing on and it works. Uh, one of the hot topics in the chat here was where is all of Ben Leposky's stuff? What happened to all that amazing stuff? Sure. Oh, so the reason I thanked my uh, parents at the end is that um, they, the house I grew up in in Cherokee was in like a, a designated flood zone. And then just with climate change, the 100 year floods now are 10 years and so on. So they had to relocate, like the government relocated them. And I went back to help them move. And my dad, before he passed away uh, five years ago, said, oh, Uncle Ben's stuff is uh, in the attic. He, you, you might want to go check it out. So almost um, a majority of the stuff that I presented today in the lecture was stuff that was uncovered in the attic in boxes. Because um, my dad knew you know, that I was an artist and working with computers and technology. So he, um, you know, he mentioned it. And so I went up there and it was the uh, the equipment that I showed as well today the oscilloscope the magnetic uh, deflection uh, units that was upstairs just collecting dust and so I brought it all down and took it that was that like that uh, kind of mini archive of Ben stuff that was like some of the first stuff I took to their new house because I knew that I had the idea that that needs to be you know documented and archived um, so. Um, the rest of the stuff, the majority, I think, I think Ben had numerous storage uh, facilities. And since he had no family, his next of kin um, were my father and my uncle David. So they were in charge of removing a lot of stuff from like seven or eight storage units. Uh, and the majority went to the Sanford Museum. But then at some point, my dad said, you know, that they were just getting tired of them showing up with more stuff. So the rest of the stuff that um, that they didn't want um, was stuff that went to the attic, and then some stuff that went to my uncle uh, David's um, in his basement. But the Sanford Museum has the majority of the stuff, um, and I don't even think they have like a that little like mini permanent exhibition in the museum anymore. Um, but I feel like I don't know. There's been more interest in this type of work, so I I don't know. Like hopefully it'll shift, and maybe when my book does come out. They can maybe restage the original exhibition and you know it'll be a, a thing again but Ben's archive the majority is with the Sanford and they've been great with me going in and 
you know, and documenting the, um, the notebooks. Like Ben, I think had eight or nine of these, um, these spiral like notebooks that just were notes and pages of mathematical puzzles. And then, um, you know, like the schematics and, um, and then uh, mainly the, you know, like mainly like uh, math uh, scrapbooks that he would document other people's math, math square or magic squares. Um, so yeah, the archive is in Iowa and then a small collection of it is with me currently. The two questions or two, two things I would like to mention. Uh, one thing is the one of the oscilloscope had quite some rust on it. Is that from some flood or? Uh, I, I think that's just corrosion from the years. I don't know. It okay. must have been. It must have come into contact with some sort of moisture. Okay. Um, and yeah, so those like so there were. I think Ben created sixty or seventy uh, pieces of equipment, and I have probably less than ten. Um, so the rest, I'm I'm pretty sure are um, are with uh, the Sanford Museum's archive. I've actually never um, seen that in person. Like I. Okay. Um, that's definitely one thing it would be nice to to uh, document if I can, you know, photograph the rest of of the stuff that he that he built. The other thing I want to mention is that the story that you hear quite often is that some large institution absorbs some collection from somebody, uh, maybe for free, maybe because the kids don't have it, don't want to have it anymore, or whatever, and it's absorbed and disappears into this black hole of a, of a huge institution. You hear that a lot. I don't want to mention names, but that happens a lot. And eventually you have some curators, some change of directions, whatever, things get lost, disappear, are not cared for anymore. And I'm like, today I would say I'm quite happy that I took full responsibility for what I'm doing and, and just going forward without not caring for all this stuff around, just do my thing. And, and we do a lot of cooperations with other institutions, but uh, I think it's good that we really do it ourselves. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't think a book about um, Ben's Oscillons would, would, uh, would happen unless I, you know, I took it upon myself, but the Sanford's been great with like, give me access to what I need. Sure. Um, but I, um, yeah, there's like I was just thinking there's a, a photograph of, of Ben's um, all of his gear, like a just like a, a big wall of like 60 or 70 of those units that uh, traveled with the uh, the original Asylon exhibition. Um, and I'd forgotten about it. And I saw it recently online. I think there was a they restaged his original show in, in Illinois at the Technical Institute there. And it's a great image. You know, it's almost like when you see a, a really beautiful like Euro rack system with just tons of everything. Um, and I'm hoping I can get a, 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 a copy of that photograph just to, to see all of the, uh, all of that work, you know, that's invested in just all these different units that he created. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that they, you know, that that equipment is still in good condition. However, the archive is at, uh, at the Sanford. I mean, it's a very small museum. It's, you know, Cherokee is just a tiny town. I mean, they are accredited, but I'm not sure. I think the, Ben's work is, in some ways, is almost bigger than the the you know the institution that's uh, in control of the estate. Oh. For me, the interesting thing is that I kind of managed to get the city government uh, interested in that kind of stuff, and eventually get some financing from them. So, uh, my father has become like a local identification figure of the city. And uh, that was not always the case, but it's, I think it's always an interesting way is to uh, find somebody locally, politician, whatever, and, and uh, get them interested in this kind of stuff and see that they, what, what kind of treasure is already there. Mm -hmm. Chris and I were just having this conversation um, in particular about the legacy of, um, of, of Woody Vasulka. Yeah. Um, because of uh, different institutions that have absorbed part of uh, part of uh, the the collection of equipment um, that they that they no longer used over the years, and then the, let's say um, some things about the current locations of of the last of the equipment that uh, that, that Stena is, um, has has uh, has put in storage and things. But um, 
it's interesting because Chris's job is as a, as a media uh, conservator, and my job now is tracking down old synthesizers in sheds in uh, Sweden. So <laughs> okay. kind of, uh, we're all digging around in these like mucky old archives to try to find um, these, these rusty treasures. And um, well, Eric is currently undertaking a very interesting PhD. And uh, I, I work in uh, time-based media acquisitions, doing conservation on time-based media works. So all sorts of different things, but rarely any analog electronics, occasionally. Scooby, yeah. has, do, you, do you know if it has any, have you ever tried mm, turning any of this stuff on? Actually, I was just thinking that I, uh, a few, I think the sine wave oscillator works. And then the, the course the, that Heath kit that I showed in the lecture, um, fired right up. I mean, I haven't connected to anything, but I was just curious to even if it would uh, receive power correctly. Um, so a few of them seem to be uh, seem to be functioning, but I um, actually I, I should have mentioned in the lecture as well. But um, a few uh, people I know, like Robert Ike, I'll be low. Um, they're going to do um, like an audio. There'll be there'll be a, an LP a companion LP for the book. So. Um, artists who are friends or musicians, they're gonna possibly use some of Ben's, this, the equipment that I have to create, you know, some music with like the oscillators. Um, it's kind of an homage and then it'll be, um, yeah, a companion to the, uh, to the book. So the idea is, oh, sorry. No. So um, yeah, so the idea is to use some of the equipment, the original equipment. Interesting point because we made the conscious decision that we don't, uh, I mean, the machine is there. It, we, we could make rhythmograms immediately, uh, but we don't do that. So we see that's kind of a closed work that uh, we don't want to tinker with anymore. But we might in the future. I mean, that's an open question. But at this point, we didn't uh, generate something new. I mean, the machine is there, can be seen, it works, but uh, we don't put in a photo plate and try something. It's uh, yeah. one thing I wanted to mention was the, the scale of uh, the rhythmogram machine and the some of the works is very impressive. And I guess, where did that come from? That kind of ambition for the size of these? Uh... I mean, I mean the, the, the size of the machine is pure physics. I mean, if you wanna have a pendulum which swings every second, you need, need to have a certain length. Of course. But my father was uh, like the, there's that photograph you used on the website where he's lying on this one rhythmogram. And he was doing that for uh, for a, a industrial fair for a Krupp, a Krupp uh, company. And that was used as a, as a like whatever, uh, nice piece of graphics in the, in the fair. And there are some beautiful pictures, of course, of that uh, fair booth where you can see that. I think it was in Moscow even or something. Uh, if you're interested, I can, show that to you. And my father was, I mean, uh, like he had this enlarger, which he pro just projected something on the wall. So he was uh, able to make pretty big enlargements. And uh, the one you saw there is in three pieces. And, uh, but he would be able to make an individual piece with this self-built enlarger that he had. Fantastic. Benjamin, the that uh, photograph that the festival used um, of your father, like on that like really large uh, rhythmogram, um, it kind of it resonated with me because um, I was going through Ben's notes and he was talking about other applications for his oscillons, and he and one of the things he described um, was changing the scale and trying to make it more architectural, yeah. and you know he never had the the means to do that to see if he could you know what these things look like you know, 20 times as large as they, as the, you know, the photographic prints. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we, we have a whole history of called, let's say, media walls in architecture, and that would nicely fit on a huge, uh, either on a, a Ben Lapovsky stuff or my father's stuff would easily fit on, on such a, like, like a, a huge wall or something. Yeah, scale. Yeah, scale. Interesting thing is my father did this in 49. Well, this was way before he did the rhythmograms, but he developed this kind of raster projection on women's bodies. 
And what he, what he actually never did is he never used rhythmograms as a projecting uh, piece somehow. Well, that's because the rhythmograms are like four years later, but maybe he didn't even remember that or something, or it was finished for him. But it's such a logical combination to use that same uh, rhythmograms as a, as a projecting raster for this same technique, but he mm -hmm. never used that. Chris, I wanted to um, hand it over to you for a second. I, were we gonna? We were gonna end at six, right? Yes. I mean, I don't want to keep anyone for too long. Um, uh, but I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to. Um, I'd like for you to maybe uh, share some of the um, some of the chat questions with the time that we have. Yeah. So um, Scooby, Mark is in the chat, and he was asking about um, whose work you showed, and he was asking about the sixteen millimeter moving image, and if any of that still survives. Um, and also I, Ted was asking a similar question about the correspondences around that and if you what you've currently kind of found about the moving image work and sure uh yeah ben mentioned it i didn't know about it until i read it in one of ben's letters that he had um experimented with uh 60 millimeter film and uh and, and i saw the notes um as well like you know like a um something in his notebooks about trying to film but uh, I think that's as far as it it got, and I haven't um, I haven't corresponded with the Sanford Museum after learning this, and I'm not sure if they even know about it. Um, I haven't come across like any physical, actually, like film reels uh, of that of those experiments. Um, the only I'm trying to track down um, some footage from the '60s when he was on the local television demonstrating his setup and. I think a lot of times when he, when Ben would do demonstrations, he would do just Lisa Jus and not his full thing. I could be wrong because I haven't seen um, the extent of of the system he used when he was on the local Iowa um, TV station. But I'm hoping to track that down because I think that's one of the few times where it's actually filmed. You know, the 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 oscillons unfolding in real time. Um, it would be amazing to to you know try to find that those film reels sure. so i'm on the hunt it's amazing it's amazing to me how fresh all of your research is and i think i'm just really excited to see the the book but i'm also prepared to be patient because it just sounds like such a huge project um you know sort of multiple multiple different projects there are so many different layers and i loved in your talk the kind of allusions to the context you gave so his magic uh Math, mathematical puzzles I think that's the right term yep and and his kind of interests but also the kind of like cultural and social context where you located where he was um geographically as Derek mentioned and I think that that kind of structure it seems I guess that's where you're heading with the book and uh it just seems like a really lovely way to contextualize uh the work yeah yeah I think you know, for Ben, I, I mentioned the EAT opportunity because um, he had done enough that interests them and they exhibited his work, but he just wasn't close enough to any other large cities where, you know, who knows what could have happened if he was even closer to Chicago and worked with, you know, the, the, the Technical Institute there. And, you know, he might have had more, more means, you know, financially and with like a, a facility to, you know, continue some of these ideas, even just being able to film them in real time and make, you know, make, you know, make them into motion. And yeah, I mean, both of these two uh, uh, make me appreciate how easy it is to accomplish and like relatively cost, like viable for me to do some of the things that they were doing. Uh, like I can machine things quite easily. I can build electronic circuits quite easily in my own home. And the costs are so much more achievable. Sure. Uh, and some of the experimentation, I guess, also because all of that information we have access to now is much more easily available too. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the most inspiring things that they were. And maybe Benjamin, as you said, kind of like what one person can get when they're kind of dedicating their, themselves to this kind of exploration and time. Well, and, uh, yeah. I mean, just coming back to this film thing. Because as a kid, I saw my father in the cinema. I mean, there was this kind of 
Nita, before the main film, there was like a small film, like a newsreel, and I remembered that. And so I eventually researched the German film archive and found three, three films of my mother showing my father, which was a total shock for me because I it was at the time when I was so young. And uh, what was, the, sorry, what was the second thing? I guess I was just talking about the, the kind of like individual exploration of these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, like, um, that's also a very interesting point. I mean, like, uh, I'm always finding myself pretty lazy, but uh, maybe that's not true. But uh, I, I, I totally admire my father's work attitude. Like, uh, this, like, um, if you think about the process to make a rhythmogram, it's not that like, like with my machine, with my electronic machine, it's already easy, because it's, it's basically a closed line from from the filters to the final video. I mean, I can switch that on in a moment and it, I get everything that I need uh, just like that. But what he had to do is he had to work at night because not everything is uh, tight, is uh, light, how do you call it, light tight. Uh, so, and he was using photographic plates, so he needed to work at night. And then the whole thing, because it's so big, it's very sensitive to uh, the, the floor moving. And sometimes you see actually like a record uh, record uh, groove, you see the oscillations of the floor and the rhythmograms, which is also quite, quite amazing. Uh, so it, it, I could maybe reconstruct what happened sound wise in that room. Uh, if I would go back from that grooves to the original oscillations, but anyway, he needed to work at night and then take out the photo plate, go down to his lab, develop the stuff, uh, have a look at it, and eventually go up again, tune the tune the pendula, uh, and do another take. And uh, eventually, he made three hundred in twelve years, which I mean, uh, he was pretty tight with money, so I, I would say he would not spend. Uh, too much on, on, on the photo plates actually, and would just, if he was sure that it's a good result, he would do it, but he would not just fool around. So, and all this together brings me to a point that I totally admire the work attitude that he must have had uh, doing that amount of stuff. And I mean, that was totally experimental. Of course, he was paid for, for the mural, but of course, that doesn't bring in any money. I mean, like uh, all his money was coming and good money coming in from architectural photography, but but the uh, the uh, rhythmograms were totally experimental. And if he sold something like to that local TV station, that was probably good for him, but uh, mainly he did that because he just wanted to do it. There, so, was, a, there was a comment by one of the presenters yesterday um, the, uh, that uh, John Whitney was talking about this non real time way of working and saying it's a bit like playing the piano today and hearing what you played tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I, I can definitely see that uh, in 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 um, in in your father's work because the the the, the if, even if it's not tomorrow, there's there's such a delay between the thing and and the result, and and you can only guess when you're watching this point of light move around. Yeah. yeah. What the thing is, and and I'm sure in in Ben Leposky's work there was a similar element that um, he could see stuff you know on the screen. But for example, I guess when he worked with these color wheels that people people in the chat were really interested. How do these color color wheels work? Um, that must have also been something to like get the timing right and get the coloring right in the in the image and stuff like that. And you wouldn't really know till you till you got it back out of the dark room, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, even the black and white stuff he made 10,000 uh, photographs and only thought 50 were worth exhibiting. And the, I think he made an, like 2000 color ones or maybe, no, actually, sorry, 4,000 4, and then picked, you know, another 50 plus of those. So um, I think there's a lot of experimentation. And one thing I wanted to mention, cause I know on his Wikipedia page, I noticed that towards the, the end um, that there's a mention of uh, these these lost negatives, but actually I found the negatives. Um, so I have all, I don't know how, I don't know if I have 10,000, but I have thousands of them. So I part of the book is I wanna show the entire process, not just 
the ones that um, that I show today and the ones that people kind of know about. So it's kind of like, um, you know, seeing like uh, Picasso sketches before like, you know, La Guernica. So I think it's worthwhile to, uh, to, sh to show those and, and that experimentation, because I think it took a lot of uh, tweaking to get the right RPM for the color of Cillans, because that, that technique is, um, I guess it's basics in the ways, because you're really trying to create this like, um, you, you know, it's trying to fool the eye to see all the colors as it's, as it's rotating. And uh, it makes sense why they, why color television technology quickly changed because it just wasn't a feasible way to experience television with this giant color wheel in front of your little black and white screen. I was also quite touched by Mikulic's work uh, with this uh, single frame exposure of making a film. I mean, I, I had a friend who did that and I know how, how, how tricky the whole thing is, how easily you can screw up a whole film by a wrong exposure or whatever. And uh, it touched me a lot when I saw him making uh, actually there are 24 images to a second and it, so many things can go wrong. And uh, so he did all this, this uh, animation. So. Yeah. It's a really particular kind of uh, mind and a particular kind of patience, I think, that, that lends itself to, to that kind of work, especially not working in real time, especially needing the focus and the vision to imagine this thing in its entirety before you can see any of the results of it. I think it's, right. it's, it's quite different than the way that most artists, I think, are used to working with, with, uh, with imagery and with electronic imagery and things now where it's, you, you see it before you as you're making it, you can interact with it in real time. You can really start tweaking it and you can, you know, you can get that fix, you know, you know what's, uh, you know, you can see what's happening. You can even publish that immediately, I mean. For, for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you know, Ben's system, you know, being so early in analog, there was just no memory. So it's like no way to go back. And I mentioned that he had, he had notes for the settings, but really it just, you could never repeat the same thing. Um, so then photographing it and then having to, you know, develop the film and print it, you know, it might, yeah, you never know. It's a delayed thing. Like you said, Derek, that it's uh, after the Asylon has been captured or, you know, drawn, it's like another more stages to, to get to what, um, what you hope for. Yeah, the, the, the color Asylon work, I think, um, it's really striking. I'm really surprised that we don't see more of it um, out there because, of course, the, the ones that he's most famous for are these black and white photos that were really extensively exhibited. I, I found a, uh, a, a clipping from a, the, a magazine which had my favorite title in the whole world, Recreational Mathematics. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the color oscillons are really fantastic and they connect really well with stuff that we're going to look at tomorrow, particularly the use of the ILDA laser um, to be able to draw things in real time and to modulate the, the colors. The, the ILDA laser, of course, has three laser diodes in it, a red, a green, and a blue. Some of them have even other colors as well available or, or ultraviolet in order to be able to draw on phosphorescent surfaces. So we're definitely going to be looking at um, different examples and, and ideas behind that um, tomorrow and probably also a little bit in Dubrovnik as well. Um, we're pretty much at the six o'clock mark here. Um, unless there's any other pressing questions that I missed, Chris, or... I, I think we covered most everything. I apologize to any of you as it has a couple of... But please come back tomorrow because we'll be having lots of other great presentations and talks. I guess before we ended, I just want to thank both of you so much for contributing to VecTech Festival, because I know we asked a lot of you, uh, wow. and you provided such beautiful talks, and the panel was so interesting. I This festival is like a community-run festival by artists. Uh, we're very, very grassroots, and it's just so nice to be able to include all these works that we love. Uh, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. Let's stay in touch for sure. Definitely. We're going to stay on. Yeah, thank you so much. We're going to stay online just for a second because I just want to run through what's happening later on today and tomorrow. Um, so we've got uh, artwork streaming later from nine o'clock. Um, we've got uh, Eric Lennartson, 
uh, Charles de Gula, Anthony Elliott, and Derek yourself, you are streaming tonight. And uh, then obviously tomorrow there are more talks and another screening of artists' works. So please come back and join us then. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye everyone and thank you so much.